Hello, 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 and welcome to today to today's um, VMR. Um, we have a special guest among us today, Dr. Anna Parks, and we are also thrilled to have her and spend this amazing hour together with her and solve an interesting case and see her walking through it. So I will just give a short introduction to her. Um, so Dr. Dr. Anna Parks is an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology at the University of Utah, and she received her undergraduate degree undergraduate degree from Yale University. She received a medical degree, trained in internal medicine, served as a chief resident, and completed a clinical hem hematology fellowship and NIH-funded aging research fellowship at UCFS, UCSF. Um, in addition to caring for patients with non-malignant hematologic disorders, Dr. Park um, Barks conducts research to improve the care of older adults with bleeding and thrombosis. So, Welcome, it's so nice to have you among us. And uh, yeah, the mic is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great, it's so great to be here. Yeah, I was um, back in the day, like five years ago, I was Robbie G. Hutt's co-chief. Um, so that's, so I have seen this grow from nothing to where it is now. So that's so great, Con congratulations to you all. And I'm excited to talk to you all. Yeah, thank you. And one thing I wanted to ask, um, what do you like to do outside of medicine? Are there any specific hobbies or um, something else that you enjoy doing? Yeah. So before I went to med school, I actually went to culinary school in Buenos Aires. So I love to cook. Um, I mostly cook for toddlers right now, um, <laughs> but I do love to cook. So that is that is cool. Which dishes do you like to cook right now? Oh, kind of everything. I don't. I like to cook more than I like to bake. So I don't love. I love to eat desserts, but I don't like to make desserts that much. Um, <laughs> but Argentina. I don't know if there's anybody here from Argentina. It's a very. It has very like because there's a lot of European immigration there, so it's very like French standard type foods. Um, so that's what I learned how to cook. I still do like cooking. Oh, wonderful. Um, we have one Argentinian, so you probably know there's a lot of like rich European food and meat in Argentina, but it's delicious. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, then we'll, I will um, let De Deborah introduce herself. She will be doing scribing today and share something about her. Hi, um, I'm Deborah. I'm from Brazil, actually, but I live in Argentina for seven years. So yeah, I think talking about food here, we have a lot of good food, good wine, good meat. And I, I do exercise, I say that I do exercise to it. So I think that could be something that I do outside of medicine. And I'm excited for today. Yeah, who isn't? Um, Mukun, you will do um, teaching points today. You want to maybe also say something how was your day what do you like to do outside of medicine i know you have a lot of stuff to share about that yeah sure hello everybody i'm mukun i'm a second year medical student in san francisco um you all know that i'm really into astronomy so i'll say that's the the big thing that i do outside of medicine is that i take pictures of the stars um, if you'd like to see some let me know that is just so cool and last but not least um rafa who ne actually needs no extra introduction, but I'll still give the mic to him. He will be presenting the case today. And yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Rafael, and I'm a Brazilian medical graduate. Very excited to be here. And thank you, Dr. Pax, for coming. It's really a privilege. Yeah, totally. And I totally forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm Sammy. Um, I'm a last year medical student from Medical University of Graz in Austria. Currently, I'm doing a medical rotation in Michigan. Um, today was my first day in GI, and I yeah, already enjoyed it a lot. And yeah, so I'll kick it over to Deborah and Rafa to start us off, and really excited for the discussion. Okay, um, I'm gonna, I divided the case into four aliquots and the last one will be the case resolution. So four aliquots plus the case resolution. 
The first aliquot, this is a 29 year old male that presented with acute chest pain after 30 minutes of exercise in the gym. The pain persisted for about 20 minutes and he denied any previous similar episodes. This patient reported that crushing substernal pressure, pain, lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis. And he works as a police officer and exercises every day without difficulty. On the review of systems, this patient denied fever, chills, weight loss, cough, sharpness of breath, and leg pain and swelling. And that's the end of the aliquot. So Dr. Parks, when you hear these chief complaints, um, what are you concerned about? What are your first thoughts? Yeah, um, so this is a great, um, sounds like bread and butter at the beginning, although I'm sure it'll get more complex. Um, so um, I think um, you probably all know sort of like different um, frameworks to break down a diagnosis like this. Um, and somebody who's young and otherwise healthy, healthy, one thing I always think about is that there's not a lot of incentive for them to come into the hospital. So um, it's probably um, important to make sure we're not missing something serious. So that's what I start to think about first is the don't miss diagnoses for this. And you guys are much closer to this than me. So, um, but I'm gonna try to not have my hematology hat on at first. So um, I think the, the can't miss things are things like aortic dissection, MI, um, uh, pneumothorax, I don't know what he looks like physically, but if he's tall and thin, that would, you know, make me think a little bit more about that. Um, like, you know, like rib fracture. Um, and then from the hematology standpoint, something like pulmonary embolism would be something to think about really carefully. Um, and that history would fit pretty well with this. Um, so those would probably be the big things that I think of first pass. So you mentioned um, pulmonary embolism. When you see pulmonary embolism in a young patient, what are things that you would be concerned about, questions you would ask? Yeah, so I think this, you know, um, this is not a common thing in younger people because the incidence of um, pulmonary embolism and venous thrombosis in general and arterial thrombosis increases with age. Um, and so in a young person, it should always make you think twice um, if there's some other contributing factor. So um, in young people, I always think about cancer. Um, so, um, and, you know, in older people, we can always say like age appropriate cancer screening, but in a 29 year old, there is no age appropriate cancer screening. Um, so, but, um, and importantly, there has actually been a randomized controlled trial that was published in the New England Journal several years ago that looked at the addition of uh, basically what we call pan scan, a chest CT, abdomen, pelvis to just basic um, history and physical exam to look for malignancy when somebody comes in with a new um, venous thromboembolism and it didn't seem to add any benefit. Um, so that's that's one thing, but symptom directed, um, uh, um, basically like exam and history for malignancy. So things like weight loss, does he have an iron deficiency anemia? Does he have a family history of cancer? And in a young man, I always do a testicular exam because in a young man, that's the most common malignancy. Um, so um, cancers, um, the other thing to think about is any kind of um, autoimmune disease that could cause inflammation. So the things I think about are things like um, inflammatory bowel disease, um, Bichette's, um, any, you know, ankylosing spondylitis, any, any autoimmune disease um, can increase your risk for thrombosis. So I always think about that. Um, then the next thing I think about is anatomic issues. So, um, you know, you told me that he works out a lot. So um, that always makes me think about what's called thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, so this is basically an anatomic issue wherein you have a narrowing <clears throat> um, 
some external compression essentially that causes narrowing of the veins and the arms. And as a consequence, you can get upper extremity DVT and then you get embolization to pulmonary embolism. Um, the reason that it's more common in somebody who works out, and to be honest, it's not just working out, it's anybody who does anything where they put their arms over their head frequently. So um, that can be a whole variety of things like people who do manual labor is another thing I've seen pretty frequently. Um, so that's the most common anatomic cause in a young person, um, but you can also have, um, uh, that's, that's sometimes also called Paget Schroeder. Um, you can also have something called May Therner syndrome, um, which is a similar issue, but in the abdomen, wherein you have basically an artery crossing over a vein in the abdomen that causes an external compression um, and leads to um, uh, basically thrombosis, and then you can get embolization. So I would think about, and then the last thing um, is thrombophilia, so, or inherited, inherited or acquired thrombophilias. So those are the, some, we probably are going to get into this a lot more. There's a lot of teaching points about inherited thrombophilia, but um, in general, it is, thrombophilia testing is overperformed. It's done way too often. Um, and so, um, but um, in this, there are specific situations where it's indicated, um, and those specific situations are somebody who's young, who has what we call an unprovoked clot, um, which I'll go into in just a little bit more detail in just a second. Um, and um, anybody who has a clot in an odd location, like a portal vein thrombosis, for example, or a cerebral vein thrombosis, those are um, atypical and thus should prompt um, should prompt additional evaluation for thrombophilia. Um, and then people who have a lot of strong family history, um, and then um, women who um, are either people who have young um, female relatives of reproductive age or women who themselves are considering becoming pregnant um, or using contraception that contains estrogen. Those are some of the populations that I think more about doing an inherited or an acquired thrombophilia testing. In. Um, and I mentioned a couple of times provoked versus unprovoked. The reason I didn't jump right into that is because a 29 year old, it's very odd to have a, a venous thromboembolism. So certainly you should ask about provoking factors, things like trauma. The ones that we consider major provoking factors are trauma, hospitalization, um, surgery, a long travel, so more than four hours without getting up, and then complete immobilization, meaning more than three days, not getting up, even go to the bathroom. Um, so that's pretty abnormal in a 29-year-old. So those are provoking factors. So that's certainly something you should ask all people. But I think, Sammy, the way you phrase the question is right, which is that in a young person, these other things should be at the forefront of your mind, because it's very odd to have a pulmonary embolism or similar clot DVT or pulmonary embolism in somebody this young. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. I just loved how structured and um, comprehensive that was by anatomy, thrombophilia. Um, it's just amazing. Thank you. All right, Rafa. I just want to echo what Sammy said. Excellent breakdown. Incredible. So the second article, this patient has no um, significant past medical history and past surgical history. But when it comes to family history, this patient had a cousin with GVT during pregnancy, one paternal aunt with GVT at 32 years old, and another paternal aunt with uh, venous thromboembolism on splenic veins at 29 years old. This patient is non-smoker and denies ethanol use. Um, he does not use any medications, no allergies, and denies supplements and over-the-counter medications. I'm gonna give you um, the physical exam as well. Um, temperature for this patient is 97.6 Fahrenheit, Heart rate 49, blood pressure 128 over 93, and he's saturating 98% on neural mark. This patient is in mod moderate distress, HEENT exam, pulmonary exam, and abdominal exam, always in normal limits. When it comes to the cardiovascular exam, this patient is bradycardic, 
uh, regular, uh, no murmurs, gallops, rubs, pulses are too close by their bilaterally. When it comes to the extremities, it's warm. There are no rashes, no edema, no bruising. And I'm gonna give you just one more piece of information, which is the EKG that showed tiny bradycardia with, with ST elevation in leads one, V1 to V5. And that's the end of the article. Wow, that's a lot of intriguing information. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Parks, what do you think? Can I just ask one question? Rafa, did you say his labs are normal? Or did you I'm get sorry. the labs yet? The labs are not, the labs haven't come yet. Oh, I'm going to give you the labs in the next telecast. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Just wanted to see. Um, great. Um, excellent. Well, whoever did this case took a great history. Um, so um, it sounds like doesn't have, you know, a history of autoimmune disease. Um, and from the HPI, um, doesn't have sort of like the constitutional symptoms that would make us worried about malignancy. So that's reassuring. Um, I love that you asked about medications and supplements. So the biggest supplements, <clears throat> or excuse me, the biggest thing we worry about um, in terms of supplements for venous thromboembolism um, is testosterone supplementation. Um, and so in somebody who, um, you know, might be inclined to do that if they're like a bodybuilder at the gym. Um, I think that's um, a great question to ask about. Um, and in women, the equivalent would be estrogen. So estrogen containing birth control or estrogen for other reasons like hormone replacement, et cetera. It's a little more complex in transgender um, men and women um, that we probably don't have time to get into, but if you're interested, I can refer you to some good resources. Um, and then um, the family history um, is very interesting. So it sounds like um, on the paternal side, assuming that cousin's also on the paternal side, which I think probably is, um, there's a strong family history for VTE. Um, so that's interesting. Um, the wondering pregnancy is not, is, could be provoked. I forgot to mention that as a provoking factor, but it, you should put it in your mind in that same category as like surgery and trauma. Um, but combined with the other ones, it would definitely make me think more about an inherited thrombophilia. Um, and then um, looking at the vital signs. So um, I think the first thing, if you're really thinking about pulmonary embolism or venous thromboembolism, which this case is leading us down that path, though, of course, um, the vitals would be important for thinking about some of the other things that we mentioned, like pneumothorax, dissection, et cetera. Um, um, so I think the heart rate is interesting. So certainly maybe he's just in great shape um, and has high vagal tone. Um, it does always make me think about an inferior MI or something that something else that could be affecting the conduction system. If you see sort of like a paradoxically low um, heart rate, when you would expect that somebody who's in distress would have a higher heart rate um, or an ingestion unknown or intentional ingestion. Um, but it should make you think about ischemia um, or, um, and not just chalk it up to like a young, healthy guy. Um, and then um, it is reassuring otherwise that his vitals are essentially normal. Um, and then the EKG, again, you guys are closer to this than me, um, but, um, you know, there are classic findings, um, on the EKG for pulmonary embolism, but I'll be honest with you, the sensitivity of those is very low. Um, it's probably like, I think it's like 10%. So, um, I would not hang your hat on, um, um, the EKG findings. Now, if you find it, then that's great. But um, if you don't see it, then um, you can you can keep your um, keep your thinking broad. Um, and um, just as we discussed, like sinus bradycardia um, in somebody who is otherwise potentially in distress um, should raise your suspicions for some form of ischemia. And I think the EKG um, shows at least um, strain on the heart. Um, and um, what that's from is hard to say. Is it ischemia? Is it some sort of strain on the heart? Um, that I think is to be determined. So, um, but I think it would make me um, want to do some more investigation of the heart for sure um, with somebody more well versed in the heart than me, um, like a cardiologist or somebody who's good with a bedside echo. Um, 
And then, um, you know, in the acute setting, there's no indication to do thrombophilia testing, but um, that family history would make me think um, more carefully about it. Um, and then it would make me think about some additional diagnostic testing, um, which I'm sure you guys are already um, in, in, angling towards. Um, and so other than a bedside echo, I think uh, most of us at this point would probably get some imaging of the chest. Um, and if you're thinking about pulmonary embolism, which is what I'm usually thinking about, you should get a CT chest with contrast. Um, I probably would get an abdominal CT as well, um, just because um, there's a lot of causes of referred abdominal pain as well. And then sounds like um, an aunt had a splanchnic vein thrombosis. So um, I would probably just do a CT chest abdomen and pelvis. The secondary benefit will be you can do like a quick screen for a solid tumor at least or lymphoma with those scans. Um, and then a set of labs will be helpful. Um, and I won't spoil it, but there are some specific labs you should get if you are thinking about pulmonary embolism to help risk stratify. So hopefully we'll get those. That was just brilliant. I love the point regarding the bradycardia and the setting of this acute event and also um, lying down the low yield of, an e of the sensitivity of ECG findings in pulmonary embolism. One question I had is when you are concerned for family, for hereditary thrombophilia, mm -hmm. which are like the most common tests um, we can get mm -hmm. and which are, have the highest yield? Excellent question. So one important thing, and I mentioned this already, is that some of these tests should not be sent in the acute setting um, because acute thrombosis can affect the results. Um, as can anticoagulation. However, there are genetic tests that obviously are not affected by those. So that's things like factor V Leiden, and uh, very common in the in the U.S. It's very common. It's five percent of the population um, of the Caucasian population. It's people of European ancestry typically. Um, and then prothrombin gene mutation is the other genetic mutation. Um, um, protein C and protein S um, deficiencies, those um, you should be very wary of sending in the acute setting because acute thrombosis can um, spuriously lower them, um, as can warfarin. Um, as, um, so just be cautious about sending those. Um, that's a very common consult that I get is like low, you know, low to protein C, low protein S um, in the setting of acute thrombosis. Um, that ends up being normal. So um, what, be wary of sending those. Um, what am I, and then, so those are, um, and then antithrombin um, is the other, which used to be known as AT3, but now is, you can commonly refer to it as antithrombin. Um, so that's the other one. It can also be lowered um, um, in times of acute thrombosis. So we try not to send it in acute thrombosis either. Um, so those are the acquired ones and then, or sorry, inherited. And then although this patient has a suspicion for um, inherited thrombophilia based on the family history, um, you know, he's allowed to have more than one thing or something else. And so I would also think about acquired thrombophilia. So acquired thrombophilia is sort of a catch-all term, like that could include malignancy, but in terms of labs to send, so um, we do send um, anti-phospholipid anti testing. Um, now that again, um, so the DRVBT, which is um, the um, kind of like functional test, that is affected by acute thrombosis um, and is affected by many anticoagulants. Um, and so it's a little hard to interpret, um, but the antibody testing, so that's anticardiolipin, IgG and IgM, and then beta-2 glycoprotein, IgG and IgM, those are not affected by acute thrombosis. So um, this, there's a lot of practice variation um, I am pretty adamant about not sending protein C, protein S, and antithrombin in the setting of acute thrombosis. With, with antiphospholipid testing, I have a little more flexibility because it does affect which anticoagulant you choose. And so if it's negative in the acute setting, it's actually quite helpful um, because you're not worried about false positives, if that makes sense. Um, if it's positive, then that's more complex um, and needs to be repeated because um, it could just be spurious, um, it, the DRVBT. So, um, so those are, and then the other thing that I typically do is I screen the CDC 
Um, and if I see any elevated blood counts, um, either white cells, red cells, or platelets, then that makes me think more about a myeloproliferative neoplasm. I also always send that um, as well as a paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria test um, if people have splanchnic vein thrombosis, because there's a very strong association between JAK2 in particular and splanchnic vein thrombosis. Now, if they don't have any CBC abnormalities and it's not a splanchnic vein thrombosis, I don't send those, PNH and JAK2. Um, and PNH um, typically has either hemolysis or cytopenias. Um, but if they don't have any of those findings on their CBC, then those are not usually my first pass. Um, and, and, you know, unless there's other concerns for some other reason, um, or if they have a lot of recurrent thromboses and we can't figure it out. Um, but in general, those are the tests to send. Wow, that was just amazing. I think we all know now um, how to work up thrombophilia. So thank you so much. Ravi, uh, not Ravi, Rafa, what did happen after that? So many R's, Ravi, Reza, Rafa, <laughs> don't worry. Okay, uh, the third alcohol, the white blood count was 11.8, and the hemoglobin and the platelets were all normal. The creatinine was 1.3, uh, LG, LGL 113, HGL 61, and ur urine toxicology was negative. Stroponin was very elevated with 12.3. Chest X-ray was clear and CTP, like Dr. Park asked for, uh, it was negative for pulmonary embolism. This patient was actually under enteral catheterization that revealed a thrombus originating the distal left main um, carotid, I'm sorry, coronary, and extending to proximal uh, LAG leading to 90% stenosis. And that's the end of the third aliquot. Great. Um, so we talked a lot about venous thrombosis, um, but um, as we as I as we were kind of alluding to, um, the bradycardia and the EKG findings um, would have raised my suspicion that there was a cardiac ischemia going on, um, and um, you know typically we don't see V1 through V5 um, from PE, right? We typically see RV. Um, more RV findings. So, um, and then the sinus bradycardia similarly would make me think about ischemia that's affecting the conduction system. So the important thing is we've been talking about venous thrombosis. Now the literature about whether inherited thrombophilias affect your risk of arterial thrombosis is a little more mixed. Um, this is beyond what you would need to know unless you join me in the wonderful world of hematology, but um, the association between those inherited thrombophilias and arterial thrombosis is a little less strong um, with a few exceptions. Um, so again, a 29 year old man who's otherwise healthy, sounds like doesn't have a strong family history of cardiovascular disease. Um, we don't know everything about his cardio cardiac risk factors, but sounds like doesn't have a ton. Um, that would make me think more um, about um, there's, some, there's something going on that's making him have arterial thrombosis. So when I see arterial thrombosis, I shift a little bit um, so I always look at the imaging myself, as should you, or, you know, if, if you can't read a cath report, that's reasonable, no, neither can I, um, but at least talk with your other subspecialists about um, what it looks like, because far and far, far, far and away, the most common cause of arterial thrombosis is atherosclerosis. Now, of course, we always think that in the cardiac arteries, but this comes up in other arteries, and I think people sometimes forget that, like, you know, Renal, vein, renal artery thrombosis, if they have a ton of atherosclerosis, is likely from atherosclerotic disease. Um, so I always look um, at the at the um, imaging or you know talk with the subspecialist to see if they saw you know premature arteriosclerosis in this patient. Um, then I think a lot about actually anatomic issues. Um, so things like dissection, um, or if this patient had aberrant coronary anatomy, um, you know, that's congenital or whatever, and just had gone undiagnosed. Um, so that's certainly something that you should think about, um, as well, although the catheterization would have, um, revealed that. 
Um, then the other things I think about that cause arterial thrombosis. So cancer, again, causes both arterial and venous thrombosis. Um, some of the other things I mentioned, antiphospholipid syndrome causes arterial and venous thrombosis. Um, DIC causes arterial and venous thrombosis. HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, causes arterial and venous thrombosis. Um, and then JAK2 mutation and PNH, um, it's a less strong association, but can, can cause arterial thrombosis. Now, the other inherited thrombophilias, that is a much more complex question. Um, it's truly not clear um, if it's strongly associated, but if it's a 29-year-old with an MI, which is as it is in this case, um, then um, it behooves you to at least think about it, um, especially with the family history. So, um, so I think it's definitely reasonable to send, um, in part because it may also affect your management um, about whether to use antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation or a combination of the two. Um, as well as like how far to go in terms of looking for a malignancy, for example. Um, so that is how I would think about this is it's a little bit of a shift in that you should always think about our atherosclerosis first, anatomic issues second. Um, and then after that, start to think about either the inherited or acquired causes of thrombophilia. Um, and in somebody who's 29, an MI is obviously very different um, from somebody who's older or has other vascular risk factors. Thank you. That was amazing. Oh, I'm just having a question. Um, I know that I, I faintly remember that hyperhomocysteinemia can also mm -hmm. present with arterial and venous thrombosis. Would you consider that? Um, is this getting worked up in reality? What's your experience with that? That's an excellent question. So um, the moral of the story is MTHFR mutation is another one that people ask a lot about. And then homocysteine. Those are still sent fairly often but the data do not support them as a major cause of ar arteri arterial thrombosis. Um, so um, in general, we do not send them. The one exception would be potentially somebody like this. However, because it's a congenital dis disorder. And so, but I would not send it first pass. Um, and I, I would, I would, I think there's a urinary study. This is how infrequently I send it. <laughs> um, there's a urinary study to look for homocystinuria. Um, and so I'm not going to go even more into that. I would not send it first pass because the data show that MTHFR and homocysteine are actually not strongly associated. There's one other one that people ask about sometimes, which is factor eight level. Um, in this case, it would be factor eight elevation. So kind of the opposite of hemophilia A. Um, and that also um, has been shown in large population-wide studies to be a spurious association. So we don't send those um, on first pass, in part because it also doesn't affect your management. So that's sort of the big thing that I just want to emphasize like over and over and over and over again with, it, with regard to thrombophilia testing is that the vast majority of cases, it doesn't actually affect your management of the patient in front of you. Sometimes it can have downstream effects in terms of their children or their relatives, um, but in general, it doesn't affect what you do with a few exceptions, as I mentioned earlier, um, like with antiphospholipid syndrome, for example, which anticoagulant you choose, HIT testing. That's actually not a, you know, it's not an inherited thrombophilia, but m many of them don't affect what you do. Thank you. Um, so if you have, if you were um, taking care of this patient, what would be your next steps? Which tests would you want to get right now? Yeah, so I would probably send um, what I mentioned. So I would send antiphospholipid for sure. Um, I'd probably just go ahead and send JAK2 and PNH, even though the CBC is normal. This is an odd enough case. Um, and then I would send the familial thrombophilia tests for sure. Um, and then I would talk to the cardiologists again, uh, this goes without saying about, um, anatomic abnormalities and atherosclerosis, um, in terms of, you know, HIT and DIC, I would certainly, so the platelets are completely normal. And have you guys heard of the four T score? 
Um, so I, you can just Google four T score and basically run through the four T score. This patient's four T score would be like zero, maybe one because it's thrombosis, um, but doesn't have any heparin exposure based on our history. So, um, now the other things to ask about, and I actually forgot to mention this. So, um, uh, so you, you guys have probably all heard. So the Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca um, COVID vaccines did have an association with thrombosis. It was predominantly venous, um, but it was catastrophic venous clots. Um, so I might ask about vaccination, um, uh, but again, that's that would be very odd um, because it predominantly was on the venous side. And that was due to something called VITT, um, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. So a very, it's similar, very similar to HIT in that the drug acts to promote formation of antiplatelet antibodies um, and people tend to have low platelets. So um, I probably would not send those things in this patient unless there was something like very odd um, about, or, or something that on history that made it more likely. For DIC, I would look for a consumptive coagulopathy. Um, so I would just send coags, including fibrinogen. So INR, PT, and PTT, and then fibrinogen. Um, and if those are normal, then you've essentially ruled out DIC as well. So, um, so that's what I would start with. Um, and then say, same as I was discussing earlier, don't forget to do a good physical exam um, and, um, to look and ask about, re-ask about symptoms concerning for malignancy, because that's often missed in these cases. And arterial thrombosis is pretty strongly associated with malignancy. All right. Thank you so much, Rafa. Um, will the next uh, uh, eloquent reveal the diagnosis? Or? Mm -hmm. uh, start off, <laughs> it's the hematology workup. <laughs> okay. So uh, the team asked for homocysteine uh, levels were within normal limits, cardiolipin within normal limits, beta-2 glycoprotein within normal limits, MTHFR deficiency also normal, prothrombin mutation normal, but this patient had was homozygous positive for the factor V lighting mutation. Uh, this patient came back three months later and protein CS were within normal limits, antithrobin deficiency within normal limits, and lupus anticoagulant coagulant also within normal limits. And there's just one more article. Okay, Dr. Parks, now we have these findings. What do you think? You were saying earlier that it's not that strongly associated with arterial thrombosis, and you see that. What, what do you think? It's so it's not it's I mean it, it's associated but the association is much less strong than for venous thromboembolism, but in somebody with no other risk factors and no other reason to have an MI you know to have an arterial thrombosis, um, I think you kind of have to pin your hat on it. Um, and as I mentioned, um, this is and this is where the data really do get murky. And so, um, I do think it's reasonable to send because it can help inform management. So it's a reasonable decision if you have a factor V light of mutation um, um, to consider sending or to consider anticoagulation instead of antiplatelet therapy, or probably what most people would do would be to do like one single antiplatelet therapy um, plus um, anticoagulant, like low-dose anticoagulant. This is beyond the diagnostic reasoning in the case, but I think it's helpful because when you're doing diagnostic reasoning, this is, I think, where sometimes diagnostic reasoning can fail us in that, like, you know, of course it's interesting and we all want to know the answer, um, but with something like genetic thrombophilia testing, that has huge implications for patients. In the U.S., at least, it can affect insurance status. It, of course, affects family members. I think what the most, the biggest effect is that if people know and think they have this genetic mutation, they think they're going to like die of a clot. But in fact, the risk of first time thrombosis for many of these mutations is quite low. It's, you know, two times the general population or 1.5 times the general population, but the absolute risk is quite low. Does that make sense? Um, so um, 
So anyway, but I think in this case, I probably would think that that's sufficient to pin this on factor five Leiden with a family history. Really, we've ruled out other things, I'm assuming. Um, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to, I, I would make sure, you know, this is the time where I would talk to the cardiologist and just make sure there's nothing anomalous that we're missing because it isn't the strongest association in the world. But if you ruled everything else out, then I think it's reasonable to, to say that this may be associated with inherited thrombophilia and that it should affect your management in this case. Okay, thank you. And there was a question in the chat by Rafa. Is the fact that someone is homozygous for the mutation, oh. um, is it stronger associated with arterial thrombosis or sorry. not? Is the yes. prognosis worse? That's such um, a good question. And sorry, I didn't mention that. So um, those those um, relative risks I was mentioning, like 2X and 1, that's for heterozygous. Um, for homozygous factor V Leiden and, or compound heterozygous, so like prothrombogen mutation and um and factor V Leiden, that's much stronger. Um, it's like 20, 10, between 10 and 20 X, the general population. So it certainly is stronger, but that's for venous thromboembolism. It's still true that the association is not as strong for arterial thrombosis, but homozygous factor V Leiden in this patient um, is, would be enough for me, um, having ruled everything else out. And you're exactly right. It's very important whether they're homo or heterozygous. For example, if you were to read the guidelines for whether to use prophylactic anticoagulation during pregnancy um, in somebody with an inherited thrombophilia, it's really only recommended if in people who are either homozygous or compound heterozygous. Um, and then just to give you guys a sense, so protein C, protein S, that's also like fairly low risk thrombophilia um, as, as similar to heterozygous factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutation. Antiphospholipid syndrome, PNH, JAK2, those are high risk thrombophilias. They come with a much, a much more, a much stronger risk in thrombosis. Um, so it's sort of, and then antithrombin is like somewhere in the middle. So it's a spectrum um, of how much each of these mutations or conditions affects your risk of thrombosis. Great, thank you. Another question I had, I know that's an atypical, atypical case for this disease, but if this would be, um, but if you would not have a, a myocardial infarction, but a DVT, for example, and it would be a 30 year old male and he was, would have been homozygous for this mutation. Mm -hmm. So you're saying he would, he would not need uh, prophylactic anticoagulation? Oh, no. So if somebody has an unprovoked clot, so meaning they don't, they didn't have surgery, they weren't admitted to the hospital, they didn't have trauma, they did, weren't on a long haul flight and they weren't pregnant when the clot occurred, we call that an unprovoked venous thromboembolism. Um, and so right now guidelines, all international society guidelines recommend um, indefinite anticoagulation for anybody who has an unprovoked venous thromboembolism, regardless of thrombophilia. So, and that's because the risk of having another blood clot in the next five years after your first blood clot that came out of nowhere is about 30%. So one out of three people will have another clot in the next five years. So those are not good odds. And people tend to recur with the type of clot that they had. So that's the other thing I take into account. And then what we weigh that against is the risk of bleeding on blood thinners. And that's about one out of a hundred a year. So one out of three versus one out of a hundred. It's that's, that's why the recommendation is to continue um, blood thinners indefinitely after unprovoked VTE. Um, and that is why thrombophilia testing for the most part does not change management because the recommendation would be to do blood thinner indefinitely, no matter what, to prevent recurrent thrombosis. Um, and in this particular case, um, if somebody has a known strong thrombophilia, which is what I would call this, um, and has a history of clot, even if it's provoked, <clears throat> pretty much everybody would do indefinite anticoagulation in that patient because their risk their their risk is high enough to outweigh the downsides of a blood thinner. Thank you so much for this.
answer I've <laughs> I had no clue. All right, Rafa, um, take us home. Actually, there's a, a question on the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there's a question. Is having a blood clot under the age of 50 unprovoked or provoked another reason to perform the thrombophilia workup? So unprovoked, yes. Um, provoked, it's a little less clear. And most people would not do thrombophilia testing for provoked clot, regardless of age. If somebody had multiple provoked clots, then that would prompt you um, to do thrombophilia testing. But yes, age, these are, I just wanna make sure everyone knows, this is expert guidance. Um, so it's like a group of people who do this, who sit in a room together. Now it's informed by data, but there's no randomized controlled trial to answer this question. So um, there's a lot of variation in how people practice this, but in general, thrombophilia testing is overused. Um, but, and, and it can have negative consequences um, as we kind of discussed. So, um, but yes, I think any young person who's having multiple clots or a single unprovoked clot or a family history, or a weird location um, or arterial, obviously, that should prompt you to go ahead and get um, thermophilia testing. Thank you. Okay, Rafa. Oh, incredible discussion, Dr. Parks. So case resolution, this patient was diagnosed with ACS and he started on aspirin and ticagrelor and his ACS was thought to be due to this homozygous factor 5 lighter mutation that led to an acute thrombus in his coronaries in the absence of other atherosclerotic factors or plaque noted on catheterization, just like Dr. Beck mentioned. Uh, thank you very much. It was a, such a thoughtful and excellent discussion. Great. This is such a good case. This is like, this comes up all the time. I see this very frequently. So it's a rare case, but um, you guys did a great job presenting it. Um, it was, you had all the relevant information, so. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Parks. I think we all have now much more clarity regarding thrombophilia and I really learned a lot um, from this amazing hour and just wanted to say thank you again for joining us today and providing such an expert discussion. Um, if you would have three takeaway points that you want, would want um, all of us to take away from this session, um, which would it be? Yeah, I think it's probably the differential diagnosis um, for a clot in a young person. And I use less than 50 as the cutoff. Um, so there's inherited and acquired causes like we talked about. So that's one. Um, and then second would be the differential diagnosis for arterial thrombosis. And we all want to think about the zebras, but make sure you think about the horses at the same time, which is atherosclerosis and then anatomic defect before you start going into things like PNH. Um, Cause most of the time it's, it's a horse, not a zebra. Um, so those, I, I think it's just those two. Those are the big ones. <laughs> oh, and then, and then I think more general teaching, like the more common thing that you'll see is an older person um, with an unprovoked venous thromboembolism. International society guidelines right now would support indefinite anticoagulation in that patient because the risk of thrombosis is higher, much higher than the risk of bleeding. Of course, you have to reassess that annually, but right now that would be the recommendation. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, if there are no more questions, I would um, give it over to Makun to take us home with teaching points. Sure, hello everybody. This was such a cool case. I am particularly fond of hematology, so it was fun for this to be my first set of teaching points. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go over this relatively quickly um, because we've already had so many amazing teaching pearls given to us during the session. Uh, but I'll start with just talking about how to evaluate a young patient with chest pain and or a young patient generally. Uh, I think it was so valuable to mention that people who are young are not particularly inclined to come into the hospital for no reason. So. Uh, consider in particular why this patient is coming into the hospital and why are they coming in right now? 
Uh, we talked about uh, a pulmonary embolism being less likely in younger patients as the risk of thrombosis increases with age. And so uh, in addition to all of the other uh, amazing teaching points that we have already discussed, um, age appropriate causes um, of thrombosis or inflammatory syndromes, autoimmunity and or testicular cancer in this patient should be considered. Uh, we learned about thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, which I will leave you all to look up in more detail on your own, but this was news to me, a really great uh, diagnosis to put on the differential in terms of compression of the vasculature, uh, especially leading out of the arms. Uh, if it's compression of venous vasculature, we might be seeing thrombosis in somebody where that might not otherwise be a, uh, an important diagnosis. Uh, and the last teaching point for, from the first section uh, was talking about a paradoxically low heart rate, uh, sinus bradycardia in this patient who we might expect to actually be tachycardic, indicates that there might be some cardiac etiology. In particular, uh, an inferior MI is, is a, a possibility since the right coronary artery, which is occluded in inferior MIs, also supplies the SA and the AB nodes. Getting into the bulk of the discussion about the, uh, the heme part of the case, uh, we talked about what to look for uh, in patients who might have a thrombophilia. Uh, we talked about uh, patients who have thromboses in rare locations, such as the portal veins or cerebral veins. And we also talked about uh, the role of uh, oral contraceptives, which contain estrogen and or exogenous testosterone supplementation as potential causes of thrombophilia. Uh, there was a really great point here about protein C and S in antithrombin-3 labs, which may read as inappropriately low in the setting of acute thrombosis. And so it's important to consult your hematologist when you think about ordering these labs. Uh, and the last teaching point from this section was about vaccine-induced thrombophilic thrombocytopenia, which presents like HIT uh, and is potentially associated with massive venous thromboembolisms in people who've received the Johnson & Johnson or the AstraZeneca vaccine. We went through a great differential diagnosis for inherited thrombophilias, which includes factor V Leiden, the prothrombin 20210 mutation, protein CNS deficiencies, and familial antithrombin deficiencies. And we also talked about how some of these diagnoses are higher risk than others. We also talked about JAK2 mutations, which are responsible for many myeloproliferative disorders being strongly associated with splanchnic vein thrombosis in particular, and to consider these diseases when you might see a splanchnic vein thrombosis. We went through a really excellent evaluation of arterial thrombosis, uh, and we talked about seeing horses first and not zebras. So start your differential with the possibility of atherosclerosis or an anatomic defect, but also consider a variety of more rare conditions such as antiphospholipid syndrome, DIC, so on and so forth. We've covered these already, so I won't repeat them too much. Um, but we had a really excellent data point about uh, JAK2 mutations and PNH being somewhat associated with arterial thrombosis, factor V Leiden in its heterozygous form being less associated with arterial thrombosis, but that in this patient, given his age and given his presentation, and given the fact that he was homozygous for a factor V Leiden mutation, we are most likely to suspect that this was indeed the cause of his MI. And finally, uh, we have uh, a little pearl about factor V Leiden itself, uh, which is that it's a mutation in factor V, which uh, is a, a, a key way of, of breaking down factor V and inhibiting overexcitation of the um, coagulative cascade is by it's cleavage through the protein C mechanism. And this mutation prevents factor V from being broken down by activated protein C, and therefore you get thrombosis in somebody who might not otherwise have it. Thanks, everybody. This was such a great case. Really happy to be here. Thank you so much, Mukun, for this amazing overview um, and great teaching points. Um, and thanks again, Dr. Parks, um, for joining us today and discussing this case. It was just so educational, and I think we all learned so much and had a great time. So thank you again for that. And yeah, I wish you all a great rest of your day.
and hope to see you next time. Thanks again.